Yeah, welcome to the 27th Chaos Communication Congress in Berlin. So we are happy that you all made it here through wind and snow and pre-sale system. And uh, we and hope you should enjoy your time. And uh, to all the people who couldn't make it here, we hope that you enjoy the stream. And uh, we're starting with the keynote by Rob Congrad. Um, good morning. Um, right here, exactly five years ago, Frank Riga and myself held a lecture that was called We Lost the War. Uh, it was about how we felt the fight over privacy and wider civil rights was going. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, it wasn't a very happy story. Um, it was at the height of the post-9-11 paranoia. It was a done deal that the whole EU was going to have data retention. And Frank and I set out to explore the future a little bit. I guess the pessimism in our talk was partly inspired by the awe, the sheer awe that we felt over this perfect storm. What we saw felt like, at that point, a desperate last stand in a world which was facing economic non-sustainability, climate change, major power shifts, and the end of cheap oil and many other natural resources. Um, all of this was happening in the next few decades. Each independently, these are factors capable of causing serious mayhem. Now, a lot of what we predicted for the short term did, in fact, play out. It's many more people today than in 2005 that the world is headed for turbulent times, and that this perfect storm that we saw is still very much out there. But obviously the fight over privacy is still ongoing, so in that sense we were wrong. We did not in fact lose the war, at least not completely and not everywhere. In Germany this became apparent when the Constitutional Court started defending privacy and civil liberties in earnest. Many of you already know this. They first told the government that cops cannot go randomly OCRing license plates of, of, oops, of traffic whizzing by on the, on the road just because they feel like it. Then they ruled that spying on people's computers is like spying in people's bedrooms and that it needed the same sort of stringent, uh, stringent laws to make sure that that didn't happen all over the place. And then to cap it off, they killed data retention in Germany, at least for now. The courts saved the day in such a grand way, and, and I think nobody in 2005 thought that was a very likely outcome, including the people that brought these cases to court. Imagine how easily these judges, like so many other judges, could have gotten all these complex issues wrong. Um, if you compare Germany to a bus, then it's like these judges jumping out of their seats, pushing aside the driver and pulling the handbrake just before the bus tumbled into the ravine. And for them and for all of us, I hope these judges on the court live long enough for the rest of Germany to also see it that way. Uh, at this point, the bus driver is just trying to get these judges to release the damn brakes so the bus can keep moving. In March 2008, after the government installed spyware decision, but before it killed data retention, I wrote a long blog post admitting that I had given up too early and that at least in Germany, the fight over privacy was still ongoing. But I li don't live in Germany, I live next door in the Netherlands, and the perspective there is a little different. For one, we have a constitution, but no constitutional court. I've said this before, but under the Dutch system, it's simply assumed that parliament would never pass a law that would be unconstitutional. So the constitution is sort of a, a voluntary guideline for lawmakers. Um, and just in case the constitution would get in the way of, of, of making laws, every prohibition in the Constitution ends with, unless warranted by law. Um, now, I don't only want to be negative. Uh, our Constitution does protect us, for instance, from munis municipal governments who can't make laws. So if they go rogue, we're protected by the Constitution. Um, what this means in practice is that the in the Netherlands, you need a parliamentary majority to stop anything bad from happening. So in the Netherlands, fear-mongering is a very effective way to pass oppressive laws and gain more power. And it has been used as such. Against the backdrop of increasing xenophobia, the Dutch are databasing everything that involves moving people, money, or bits to be used against us in various ways. We are now at the point where, without any specific suspicion, 
a Dutch homeowner can get a letter announcing a search of their home on a specific date and time in order to, quote, make the city safer. And whatever bits of surveillance states are missing in the Netherlands are being built at breakneck speeds. I think we can safely say that when it comes to civil liberties, my country is downwardly mobile. Lots of reasons, but I get on, to, on the top of my, I guess on the top of my list is a 20-year crisis in education. Uh, that would be a talk in itself. Um, the Netherlands used to be a country like Denmark or Sweden, then it was a country like Germany for a while in the 90s. And after a really confusing period in the, in the zeros with political murders and, and crazy political movements, it's now approaching England and it's still going down. I'm, I'm sort of still guessing that we're... <laughs> My guess is still that we'll level out somewhere before we reach the level of Italy, but it's really, <laughs> it really is becoming hard to tell. Now, I could talk more on some of the interesting things that are happening in the Netherlands, but that would also take a whole hour. Uh, what is important is that some of these things have served as examples of how things can go wrong, and that these examples were used, for instance, in the cases before the German Constitutional Court. So after 25 years, my country, the Netherlands, again has a leading role in discussions on privacy and civil rights. We are now the negative example that helps keep other countries avoid some of the worst transgressions. The last thing I will say about the increasing differences between the Netherlands and Germany is that Germany is not immune to any of the things that happened in Holland. Please remember that the market is not the answer for everything. Make sure that you keep your educational system functional. Watch where funding for political parties comes from, very important. Keep resisting fear as a basis for politics and quite literally by all means defend your constitution and your constitutional court. Now, Going back to this we lost the war speech five years ago, we actually ended up motivating a lot of people by pointing out the seriousness of the situation that we were in. Also, people see that technology is there and that they see all these nasty possibilities of technology and then they have this vision in their head that when the situation gets really bad, the hackers will come out and they'll magically save the day. And I think it's been healthy for people to hear that hackers themselves felt that this was a really bad situation that they didn't have easy answers for. Um, we probably also demoralized a few people. Maybe in retrospect we shouldn't have been quite that negative. But in the 17 years before we lost the war, I personally brought a lot of my positive joy, my amazement to Congress. Uh, phone freaking, pager receivers, access for all, the fight against Scientology. Um, and after this speech, I did so with the, the whole voting machine episode, which also was a very positive story that ended well. So I think it's, it's okay for people here to see some of my negative and, and more depressing sides as well sometimes. Um, a little excursion into psychology and, and my own psychology and that of our species. Um, I'm probably, as many of you here, blessed with a mild form of bipolarism. That means I have lots of ups and downs. Uh, I don't get clinically depressed, I don't stay in bed for weeks, I never contemplate suicide, but I do have ups and downs. And around 2005, this came together with my probably midlife crisis, and I was grumpy and I was pissed off. Um, there were some personal factors, but the situation in the Netherlands and in the world was really a big part of the problem. Uh, this did get to a point where more and more people around me were telling me to go see a doctor. They told me, look, there's these pills now. You can be happy. You don't need to be like this. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many people told me this, that really being unhappy for a prolonged period of time has become socially unacceptable over the past 20 years. Now, the role of depression, and, and again, I was never really clinically depressed, but the role of depression in the individual is understood to be the force that forces change where change is short-term, painful, or costly, but much needed in the long-term. And reading up on the truly insane numbers of people on antidepressants and other psychoactive pharmaceuticals, I can't help but wonder whether this unhappiness forces change principle stops at the individual. Could it be that we're prescribing antidepressants to so many people out there that we're now below the threshold on relatively smart, relatively resourceful, but unhappy people 
that are needed for society to make change. My sense is that this is a huge story, a story of a civilization destroying its capability to fix itself by making everybody artificially happy. I know this is not our field per se, but I feel this is at least, this is at least as big a story as many of the issues that this community is working on. I think in the future we'll see a scientific field called pharma pharmacological political science or something like that. And I have a feeling that people of the future cannot really understand our time without that field. One of the positive suggestions we did offer in We Lost the War was to focus on battles that could be won. If I had listened to all of these people around me, I would have been taking Prozac or Zoloft in 2005. My life would have been different and possibly much happier, especially in the short term, but a lot of things that happened to me since would not have happened because they involved me being angry and attempting to do something about it. Um, I'll quickly go into this electronic voting thing. Thank you. My own city, Amsterdam, opted to buy electronic voting machines for the elections of 2006. And I knew there was no possibility to verify the election outcome and that one had to essentially trust proprietary and secret software to have any trust at all. I spent the next two and a half years investigating, campaigning, lobbying, lawyering. Uh, around the same time, Ulrich Wiesner and his father Joachim were fighting voting machines, the same voting machines made by the same company here in Germany. I won't get to, into all of the details because that story has been told at previous congresses, but the short version is that the ensuing fight involved large parts of this community and that today these machines are not legal for use in elections in either country. Now, in Germany, that outcome is cemented securely in place by a constitutional court ruling that gives citizens the right to see with their own eyes whether election results come from something real or whether they come out of software somehow. Um, in the Netherlands, we'll have to fight this battle over and over again, all the time debating complex issues with small town mayors and municipal employees because we have no constitution. Um, I won't go into any de every detail of what happened to me since 2005, but I did have a really crazy past year. Maybe not quite as crazy as some of my friends, but still. For one, I probably traveled more in the last year than I, or year and a half than I did in the 10 years before that. It started in October 2009 when Julian Assange and myself were keynote speakers at Hack in the Box in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. We subsequently spent a month in the sun traveling Malaysia, Thailand, and Cambodia. We got to know each other pretty well. A month or two after previous Congress, Geeks was still a relatively obscure, geeky, but gutsy journalism project. Julian and Daniel got a standing ovation while they stood on this stage speaking about WikiLeaks and about new opportunities for protecting freedom of the press in Iceland. Three weeks later, I was in Reykjavik with them and others to help write a proposal for IMI, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. Then I was home for a week and then I left for India to speak on voting machines. All of India has been voting on black box style voting machines for the past decade, so that's a billion people. And it's beginning to dawn on some of these people that there's a problem with transparency. I was there with Alex Haldeman, an e-voting related professor from the University of Michigan, and Till Jaeger, the German lawyer who won the case against voting machines here in Germany before the Constitutional Court. Together we met with politicians and we spoke at conferences, but probably the most important thing that happened was for Alex and myself to study an actual Indian voting machine together with our Indian colleague, Hari Prasad. Then I was home for three weeks again and I left for Iceland, this time to help out on releasing a video that's now famous, the Iraqi helicopter video that was released by WikiLeaks. I didn't plan for that. I read the WikiLeaks Twitter feed, concluded that Julian needed some help, and I flew out a few hours later. I stayed for two very hectic weeks, helping produce the video and then traveled with Julian to a press conference in Washington. After that, I had to get back to writing the study on the Indian voting machines, which, hardly surprising, were just as easy to manipulate as any other black box voting system ever studied. We proved, yet again, that anyone with access to the machines could easily change the outcome of the election. Then later in the year, I went to Brazil to look at e-voting there. Now, their systems are even more dangerous than anyone else's. It's black box voting machines, but they get the ID card numbers of the voters entered.